Hello, my name is Pearl McCainy. Welcome or welcome back to Revival Lost Southern Voices, a festival for readers. Being presented virtually this year in partnership with the Georgia Center for the Book and Georgia State University Perimeter College. We acknowledge also Georgia Humanities, which from the beginning has offered support and encouragement for the festival. One day during the Decatur Book Festival, Andy Rogers and I met among the book booths and the food wagons and began imagining how we might create an opportunity to share some of the Southern authors of the past. Revival Lost Southern Voices was born then in 2017 with the help of Greg Murray, Allison Law, and many others. Jen Kolotosti, Joe Davich, Gina Flowers, Carrie Miller, and Ali Stonewright soon joined the team and worked with the Decatur Book Festival, the DeKalb County Public Library, Emory University, Georgia Center for the Book, GSU's Kenneth M. England Professorship of Southern Literature, and Perimeter Honors Program to make the festival a reality. From the beginning, we considered the literal and figurative meanings of lost, of Southern, and of voices. The voices might be those of writers, artists, musicians of any genre. Southern is also a loosely applied modifier for a voice who is born in, traveled through, lived in the South, or whose work is about the South. South, of course, a geographic concept, is also protean, ever-changing. And lost, the festival seeks to revive the work that may be out of print or out of production, unread or underappreciated, or of renewed significance in our time, as with the writings of Lillian Smith and James Baldwin. The work may be lost because its artist is deceased or no longer writing or producing. To paraphrase P.L. Travers of Mary Poppins' renown, that which is lost is waiting to be found. Our presenters have been Natasha Trethaway, Yusef Komunyaka, Tony Grooms, and the late Terry Kay. Among those returning to present to Lost Southern Voices this year are Valerie Boyd, Brenda Bynum, Matt Dissinger, and Jamil Zadeldeen. During this virtual Lost Southern Voices Festival, we'll meet via Zoom webinars on Thursday, March 25 at 1 p.m. and Friday and Saturday, March 26 and 27 at 1 and 4 p.m. Each session can be individually registered for via Eventbrite, and each session will have a moderator to introduce the presenters and to facilitate questions from the viewing audience. Titles of books and links to the independent bookstores will be provided should you wish to pursue the work of the presenters or of the lost voices. And to affect a festive spirit, we will have a raffle for books at the end of each session and for a gift certificate to the Decatur Restaurant Revival at the festival's conclusion. Winners will be notified by email. Again, I welcome you or welcome you back and welcome you to seek to enlarge your lives by enjoying and learning about a variety of lost Southern voices. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And as Pearl mentioned, on behalf of the Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, Georgia State University Perimeter College, welcome to Lost Southern Voices 2021. We would like to remind you that after the official presentation, if you would like to ask any questions of our panelists, feel free to write those questions in the Q&A feature that you can find at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on the type of device that you're on, or feel free to type them into the chat. Also in the chat feature, we will have our full program posted, as well as a one sheet bio of the presenters and of the voices that they are presenting on this afternoon. Don't forget that we will also notify you via email if you've won today's um, raffle, which will be copies of Suffer and Grow Strong. Um, so do look for those emails coming to you next week. Right now, I would like to introduce Carrie Miller, who is an associate professor of English at Perimeter College. A Florida native, she grew up on her father's stories about farming in the Midwest and her mother's stories about Appalachia. She studies the intersection of oral histories and of fiction and is passionate about reclaiming lost voices. 
Carey's dissertation is on the forgotten 19th century New England author, Jane Goodwin Austen, who wrote a best-selling historical fiction to promote her pilgrim ancestors. Carey is currently at work on a book examining the ways that Austen's fiction helped shape Americans' beliefs about pilgrims. So will you please join me to welcome Carey Miller. Thank you, Joe. I'm really honored to introduce our panelists today, and I'm excited to hear about these unruly Southern women. It's definitely a topic that's kind of close to my heart. Um, I even can probably joke that I descend from a very long and very unruly line of Southern women myself. So our first panelist is Brenda Bynum. Brenda was a resident artist and faculty member at Emory University. In 2004, she was named a Heilbrunn Distinguished Emeritus Research Fellow. And in 2013, she received Emory's Distinguished Emeritus Award. She has been an actor and director in Atlanta since 1973, working primarily at the Alliance Theater, where she was also the acting teacher for the nationally known professional intern program, a two-year postgraduate residency. She has served as president and board chair of the Atlanta New Play Project, on the board of directors of the Atlanta Arts Festival, Nexus Contemporary Arts Center, and the Atlanta Theater Coalition, as well as on grants advisory panels for the Fulton County Arts Council and the Georgia Council for the Arts. In 2015, she received the Georgia Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities. Our second presenter is Caleb Johnson. Caleb is the author of the novel Treeborn, which received an honorable mention for the Southern Book Prize. He studied journalism and art history at the University of Alabama and earned an MFA in creative writing from the University of Wyoming. His writing can be found in the Carolina Quarterly, the Paris Review Daily, Southern Living and elsewhere. Currently, he teaches writing at Appalachian State University. And our third panelist is Carolyn Curry. She holds a BA in English from Agnes Scott College and an MA and PhD degrees in history from Georgia State University. She has taught at Westminster Schools in Atlanta and the University of Kentucky. In 2015, she was named Georgia Author of the Year in biography by the Georgia Writers Association. In her book, Suffer and Grow Strong, The Life of Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas was selected as one of the books all Georgians should read by the Georgia Center for the Book. Carolyn is the founder and chair of Women Alone Together, a nonprofit foundation created to meet the needs of women who are alone in our culture. The well being of women, past and present, has been her lifelong passion. Carolyn resides in Atlanta, Georgia. And with those introductions, we're going to turn it over to Brenda Bynum, who will be reading excerpts from her dramatic presentation of the life of Helen Matthews Lewis. And it's entitled, What Am I Supposed to Do Now? Helen Matthews Lewis has lived a life, a huge life, filled with politics and passion, humor and tears, compassion and determination, kindness and joy, astounding accomplishments, and countless friends, colleagues, and students who have set about making the world a better place because she taught them how. She has been a scholar, an educator, an activist, an organizer, an innovator, a leader, an author, and a bartender in Wales. She has taught in colleges and universities, traveled and lectured all over the world, won numerous awards, written nine books, and pioneered an entire field of study in Appalachian life and culture. She has spent her life as a radical force for change in the lives of women, racial minorities, and coal miners who have been economically marginalized by the forces of corporate greed. Her progressive heart and spirit have been unstoppable for over 90 years, and she is still at it. She has lived her life the way life is supposed to be lived, with grace, guts, and vision, and we can all be grateful that she did. Sometimes I've wondered how in the world I turned out the way I did. Nobody could have seen it coming in 1924 when I was born way out in the country in Jackson County, Georgia. The people were poor, they were not educated, we had segregation, and women stayed home like everybody thought they should. My father was a farmer then, but not long after I was born, he passed the test to be a mail carrier, and we got to move into the little town of Nicholson, and we were a lot better off because that job took us through the Depression. And maybe that's where it started changing for me. My father had me to ride with him on his route, and I saw that he was kind and respectful to everybody, whether they were black or white, whether they had money or not, no matter who they were. I learned from watching him early on how people are supposed to treat each other. And then I learned from watching other people 
how we are not supposed to treat each other. So anyway, we were living in Nicholson and I was probably about six years old and my father came home one day and he said, come on, get in the car. I'm gonna take you over to meet the best educated man in the county. So we go over to what is the black folks community and we go to see Mr. Rakestraw. That's what my father called him, Mr. Rakestraw. And he was a preacher and a teacher and a black man who was the best educated man in the whole area where we lived. And so my father told me he could write the most beautiful writing and he asked him to write down my name for me. So Mr. Rakestraw got out this card and wrote out my name for me on it in calligraphy. And I just thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. So I took it home with me and I kept it and I was so proud of that. Well, later on, I was in the house one day and my mother had a group of women there who were in the front room quilting. And Mr. Rakestraw comes to the back door and knocks. And I get so excited when I go to the back door and there's Mr. Rakestraw. So Mr. Rakestraw is in my house. I run into the front room where the ladies are quilted and I say, Mr. Rakestraw is here. Mr. Rakestraw is here. And the room got real quiet. And one of the ladies just looked at me and shook her head and said, you don't call one of those people Mr. I was absolutely crushed. And then they all started laughing at me and I just ran off crying and raw, crawled way up under the house and I stayed there till my father came home. And when he came and found me under there, I told him what had happened and he said, it just doesn't seem right somehow, does it? And you know what? That became a slogan of mine for the rest of my life. Whenever I began to see something that didn't seem right, I would remember what he said and how he said it. And it has always stuck with me. It was a turning point for me, and I believe it changed my life. And then I guess where I really got turned around in my life was when I first heard Clarence Jordan. He converted me, there is no doubt about it. I was going to college at Bessie Tift, this tiny little Baptist college for girls down in Forsyth, Georgia, and we had to go to compulsory chapel. And I was thinking, oh no another preacher. But I was sitting there that day and the speaker came in and it was Clarence Jordan, who had just graduated from Southern Seminary and was founding this interracial farm down in South Georgia called Koinonia. And he started telling the story of the Good Samaritan and it was a cotton patch version with this old black man. And I started listening and I started thinking, that's it, that's it. And I'd gone to Sunday school and all and heard all that religious stuff. And I'd had my experiences with segregation, but I just hadn't put it together. And I sat there listening to him and Clarence Jordan, Jordan put it together. And I heard him tell that story. And I remember saying, that's what it is all about. That is what it's all about. And for me, well, that's when religion and liberalism and whatever you want to call it, being radical and all, that came together for me for the very first time. It got pulled together for me right there by Clarence Jordan. It just turned my mind around and it made a big old change in me. Wow, so I used up all my money that first year and had to leave Bessie Tift in 1942 and go up to Atlanta to get a job. I lived in a boarding house on Ponce de Leon near the Fox and spent all day in an office with a bunch of other girls typing insurance papers for trucks, numbers, and all that stuff. So as soon as I'd saved up enough money to do it, I went down and enrolled in Georgia State College for Women in Milledgeville, where I stayed from 1943 to 1946. I had a job working in the library 20 hours a week to help pay my way, and I also worked on the 1945 yearbook with one Mary Flannery O'Connor, who was also in school there at the time. Now, you you didn't actually work with Mary Flannery O'Connor, but worked separately and then put it together. She always worked individually and alone, but the work was always fantastic and brilliant. But you know, the really important thing that happened to me there was that I was exposed for the first time to a lot of independent women. I called them spinster suffragettes. 
They were among the first generation of women to vote and who were role models for leadership. Things got way more conservative later, unfortunately. But in those days, GSCW was a hotbed of social activism and female empowerment. World War II had changed a lot of people's minds about what women could do. And we were encouraged to go to graduate school and have professions. And I was really encouraged to read and think critically about things, all kinds of issues, and not just that, but to take action. It may sound funny, but I was truly, truly radicalized by my experience at that small little Southern woman's college. <laughs> my roommate was active in the YWCA and she got me involved in what was their big mission at the time, and that was to fight segregation. So we would go up to Atlanta and go to the black colleges and meet students there and spend the night there and eat with them and you don't get to know them. You sure couldn't do that out in public in those days. You know, one time I was spending the weekend up there with a black student at Atlanta University. And we got up in the morning and we did, went down to the dining hall for breakfast. And I sat down at a table next to another AU student. And she just got up and moved away. And my roommate laughed and said, oh, I'm sorry, but it looks like she is prejudiced against white people. That was a shocker. That was the first time I had thought about how it might work both ways and what it really felt like. I mean, she didn't even really know me. She just did not like the color of my skin. Well, in my last year at GSCW, I got involved in the League of Women Voters. Georgia had become the first state to allow 18-year-olds to vote. and We were getting students all over the state to get involved in electing a progressive candidate named Jimmy Carmichael in place of Eugene Talmadge. After I graduated in 1946, I moved to Atlanta and worked with a bunch of other young people on what everybody called the Children's Crusade to get out the vote. We called ourselves the Students League for Good Government, and we all stayed at the Piedmont Hotel, which was our headquarters. We weren't paid, but we got room and board and had a great time. Ooh, there was a lot of flirting going on too. Remember, I had been in all girls school for four years. You know, I think we brought in over 100,000 young votes from all over the state. Jimmy Carmichael actually received way more of the popular vote but we were devastated when Talmadge was elected because of the county unit system. It was a sad night in our headquarters. I left Atlanta after that to go to graduate school at Duke, but all I could think about then was finishing up my year at Duke, then coming back to Georgia, starting up a small town progressive newspaper and running for office myself. But I had a boyfriend who by then, he was a World War II veteran and he'd come to graduate school at Duke in economics. So when I left Duke to come home at the end of the year to come back to Georgia, he followed me down here. And he enrolled in a graduate program in philosophy at Emory University. I did not want to get married and I never should have done it, but I got called. Oh, no, not like you think. But my boyfriend just showed up one night, and pulled out a ring and proposed to me in, bunch of whole, in front of a whole bunch of our friends. I should have said no, but I didn't want to embarrass him or myself. And you know, I guess that's just what you were supposed to do in those days, get married. So I went ahead and said yes, and there just didn't seem to be any way to escape. So we moved into married student housing in a little trailer on the Emory campus between the post office and the dining hall, which didn't even have a bathroom. So I would have to go outside, walk up the hill with my soap and my towel, past all the regular students on their way to class, to a big trailer, which was the community bathroom, and share it with a lot of other women and children. <laughs> I used to wonder how many of those regular students we passed on the way decided never to get married themselves, after seeing what it looked like in this little matrimonial slum on the Emory campus. So anyway, while my husband was finishing school, I got a job working for the YWCA. 
And one evening in July of 1948, I was supposed to organize a get acquainted meeting for some male divinity students who had come in from all over the country to be part of the students in industry program. There was one young black man in the group. So we invited a couple we knew from Morehouse College to come along and some students I knew from GSCW who were home in Atlanta for the summer. We'd been meeting for about 20 minutes. I think we played a game. We danced a Virginia reel. And when all of a sudden, the police busted into the room, broke it up and gave us all tickets for disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace and for holding a public dance without a permit. The next morning, it was on the front page of the Atlanta Constitution with a headline saying, Mixed Dance and it listed the names and addresses of everybody who was there. All the parents of the GSCW girls were extremely upset. And one of them lost her apartment and another one lost her job because of it. So I called my father and I told him to get a copy of the newspaper and look at the front page and then call me and we can talk about it. And you know what, when he did, he just laughed and said, Helen, I am mighty proud of you. But then the time came when I had to be a wife. My husband and I left Georgia and went to graduate school <clears throat> at the University of Virginia, where I finished up my master's degree. When we finished there, he got offered a job on the faculty of Clinch Valley College. I had imagined that our marriage would be a true egalitarian partnership and we would have joint teaching careers side by side, but they wouldn't hire a wife on the same faculty as her husband. So they offered me the job of librarian and let me lecture once in a while. I didn't like it, but I accepted it. And it, I was being a good faculty wife. I was pouring tea and all and making the best of it. <clears throat> but I also started doing research and getting some grants and working on my PhD. When I got offered a real teaching job at East Tennessee State University, I took it. I was hired to create a master's program in sociology. So I left Clinch Valley and took my grants with me and commuted back and forth on the weekends. It will probably not surprise you to learn that I was fired from that job about a year later for quote, nurturing radical students, unquote. Well, I was just encouraging them to think for themselves and question the status quo and to go out into the field and gather real data instead of getting it all out of books. The students got excited and the department was growing, but the administration didn't like it and I knew it. But you know what, if they wanna fire you, they will find a way to fire you. So you might as well just keep on doing the things you don't, you do wanna do and don't just pussyfoot around, not try to be safe because you won't get anything done and they will still fire you. So that's what they did. And I had to go back home to my husband and back to pouring tea and rocking on the porch. But in the meantime, Clinch Valley had gotten a huge grant to start a sociology program themselves. And the man who was running it had quit and they had to get somebody in there fast to keep the money. And it was clear that I was the best person to run it, whether they liked it or not. So finally, I was on the same faculty as my husband. And the wonderful thing was, that was happening for me is that I was beginning to find myself. But my husband was jealous. I was his equal now in academe. I had a PhD. I was deeply interested and engaged in the work I was doing. And I guess I really wasn't being a very good faculty wife anymore. So finally, one night after a big argument, I just went out and got in my truck and I ran away from home for good. So in 1974, I was 50 years old, newly divorced, totally radical and ready to take on the world. I was really on my own for the very first time in my life. But I also had the sense to realize I had so many people behind me who'd got me ready for all the things I needed and wanted to do, even my husband. I never should have gotten married, but if I hadn't married him, I never would have moved up to Virginia and gotten into the Appalachian coal fields. 
So just like my father and Clarence Jordan and those wonderful women at GSCW and all kinds of other people, in his own way, my husband changed my life for the good. Now, if you really want to know what happened in the next 40 years, you need to get this book and read it. It even amazes me when I see all that I've done and everywhere I have been. But here I am now, I am 96 years old. And I have to ask, well, what am I supposed to do now? I can't just die. Oh, even though, you know, I've already got my casket ready on the back porch. A friend built it for me out of some pretty wood and my pals all signed it and decorated it. Right now it's back up there and I'm keeping plants on it. But it seems to me there's still plenty left to do and I wish I could do it all. But you know what? I think I'll just have to keep looking for opportunities where I can dig in and create a little trouble, a little good trouble. And remember my motto, if you can't change them or make them learn, you can confuse them and make their lives miserable. That'll start them thinking. And that's what changes the world. Thank you, Brenda, that was wonderful. Um, if anyone has questions for Brenda, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A chat. And our second panelist will be Caleb Johnson, who is gonna be talking to us today about Catherine Tucker Wyndham. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Brenda, for your presentation. It's a tough act to follow, that was really fantastic. Um, it's nice to, to see my fellow panelists and thanks to the Center for the Book and everyone else involved with this festival. I'm glad to be back for a second time. Um, so here we go. Uh, my first job out of college was working as a general assignment reporter at the Selma Times Journal. It was exhausting and exhilarating, a daily grind I wasn't quite prepared for. The newspaper offices were and still are located at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, practically dangling off the red clay bank of the Alabama River. Despite growing up in rural North Alabama, I'd never visited Selma before the day I drove down for an interview but I knew some of the city's history involving the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, and I also knew it was the home of Catherine Tucker Wyndham, whose collection of ghost tales were required reading for children in my home state. In elementary school, we'd visit the library once a week, and each student could check out one or two books I seem to recall. This was the 1990s, but our library's collection was filled mostly with titles from decades past. I remember opening some books and finding my mother and her siblings names written on borrowing cards tucked inside back covers. It didn't take us kids long to identify which books were interesting to us in the library's collection. And at the top of that list was Wyndham's 13 Ghosts series. As soon as we crossed the library's threshold, the race was on to snag one of these titles. The most popular for us, of course, was 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. It was nearly impossible to catch on the shelf. The book, as you guessed, uh, is a collection of true ghost stories gathered from around the state, and it really captured our young imaginations. The tales were scary, but not too much. Um, they, there were uh, the, they took place in towns we could point to on a map. There were illustrations and even photographs to help us picture the haunted sites and their inhabitants. An angry French architect, a quiet lady in blue, an alcoholic doctor, a war widow, a glowing white orb, a sidewheel steamer on the Tom Bigby River, among others. Perhaps none loomed larger in my mind than Jeffrey himself, who, despite appearing in the book's title, doesn't get his story told in the pa its pages, except for a mention in the foreword that he appeared in the Wyndham House about three years prior to the book's publication in 1969. Jeffrey wasn't an angry ghost. He was mischievous in a cartoon-like way, limiting his activities to hall stomping and cake moving and lamp shaking, the occasional tossed suitcase or set of car keys hidden in the freezer. Aside from a shadow seen in the background of a single photograph, the strongest piece of evidence to Jeffrey's existence was the reaction of the family cat Hornblower, who would arch his back and ruffle his fur and leap at some unseen presence. And if y'all will, will give me a moment here, I'm just gonna share my screen and we'll, I'll pull up this one photo, which some of you may have seen before. Um, so here's Miss Wyndham, um, and you can see the shadow in the background is, is allegedly 
that of Jeffrey. Um, So while working in Selma, I once had the opportunity to spend some time with Wyndham in her home. My editor came along and in truth, it was a bit of a surreptitious visit. Wyndham was being honored with an award from Auburn University and my editor wanted something in the paper about it. Knowing the humble Wyndham would never consent to an interview about some, something as unseemly as herself, my editor aimed to use me, a starry eyed young reporter to soften up the old woman by allowing her to do what she did best talk and talk and talk until stories came out. Seated at the kitchen table, Wyndham asked about some goings on in city politics, made clear she'd read my work in the paper these last few months, and told us how she'd organized an omelet making station for her great grandchildren during a recent holiday visit. I wish I remembered more that was said that day, but a recorder would have been no more welcome at the table than a revolver. To tell the truth, I had a difficult time paying attention because all I could think as we sat at the kitchen table was shit fire, I'm sitting in Jeffrey's house. Catherine Tucker Wyndham was born in Selma on June 2nd, 1918. From a young age, she began absorbing family history and local lore from her parents. By age 12, having moved to the nearby town of Thomasville, she wrote movie reviews for the local newspaper, which was owned by a cousin. This was the beginning of a lifelong career in letters. In 1940, Wyndham was hired as a features and police reporter at the Alabama Journal in Montgomery, becoming one of the first women to cover the police beat for a major daily newspaper in the South, and according to some sources, the first woman to cover a police beat in Alabama, period. She married another reporter and later they moved back to Selma where Wyndham wrote freelance articles in a syndicated newspaper column while raising three children. After her husband died, Wyndham joined the newsroom at the Selma Times Journal to make ends meet. It was around this time she began writing books as well. First, a collection of recipes collected from across the state then shortly after, 13 Alabama Ghost and Jeffrey, uh, which was co-written with Margaret Gillis Fye, a folklore teacher Wyndham had studied with at Huntington College in Montgomery. Some readers may find that the version of tales in this collection differ from the stories they have heard, Wyndham warned. Since these stories have been handed down by word of mouth, it is to be expected that there should be differences. Collections of other ghost stories from Georgia, Mississippi, and Tennessee soon followed. In each title, Jeffrey gets mentioned by name, his star rising alongside Wyndham's. 13 Alabama Ghost was even dedicated to him because, as Wyndham often said, Jeffrey's arrival inspired her to track down ghost stories in the first place. In an essay for the Paris Review Daily, Margaret E.B. writes, being haunted is a permanent condition below the Mason-Dixon, one that defines the region as much as the voracious kudzu and iced tea so sugary it hurts your teeth. William Faulkner, who was known to spin particularly scary fireside stories, described the Deep South in Absalom Absalom as, quote, dead since 1865 and peopled with garrulous, outraged, baffled ghosts. The ghosts in the stories Wyndham collected aren't really all that garrulous. Revisiting 13 Alabama ghosts throughout this talk, I found I wasn't frightened by them in quite the same way I was as a child, though some of the stories were still quite eerie like the hole that will not stay filled, which tells the story of a Spanish immigrant to Alabama who joins the Confederate army, pays someone to take his place so he can return home and tend to his sick wife, then gets lynched for deserting his post. One thing that did surprise me about this book was all the architectural details, arches and doors and columns and wainscoting and plaster work. Judging by these stories, only the stateliest Alabama homes were haunted by ghosts. However, Wyndham herself lived in a modest red brick ranch house tucked back on a lot in a quiet post-war neighborhood. I was also surprised at how much local and state history appears within these spooky stories, the effect not unlike giving a child medicine by mixing it with something sweet. There's the tale of the steamboat Eliza battle, which caught fire and sank in the Tom Bigby River en route to Mobile, and that of the unquiet ghost at Gaineswood, a Greek revival mansion in Demopolis that took 20 years to complete. In retrospect, one failing of 13 Alabama Ghosts is that despite most of these stories being set around the Civil War, the horrors of slavery go largely unaddressed. Members of the white planter class and their suffering often gets foregrounded. The blame for this shouldn't rest on Wyndham alone. A folklorist documents a specific culture after all. 13 Alabama Ghosts was published in 1969, only four years after civil rights marchers were viciously attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. This was the era of George Wallace, and if we're to believe that ghost stories arise from fears or fantasies of a specific time, then it's no surprise whoever passed down many of the tales in this collection, i.e. likely descendants of the white planters featured in them, 
romanticized in Antebellum, Alabama, rather than the present one unfolding before there in the nation's eyes. As a police reporter, Wyndham likely witnessed firsthand the violence and systemic oppression that the Old South represented. Two stories in the book do focus on this kind of suffering. The first, the crying spirit at the well, in which an enslaved man forced to dig a well gets, trap, gets trapped when the shaft collapses and his body is never recovered. The other, the face in the courthouse window. In this story, Henry Wells, a freed man, gets blamed for burning down the Pickens County Courthouse. The, th the building eventually gets reconstructed and Wells is later arrested. A lynch mob gathers outside the jail. Eventually, the sheriff hides Wells in the courthouse attic. Um, the lynch mob, oh, excuse me, Wells looks out and Wyndham writes, quote, his face gray with fear and confronted them, meaning the lynch mob, defiantly shouting at the top of his lungs, I'm innocent. If you kill me, I'm going to haunt you for the rest of your lives. And as later events proved, Wyndham writes, he did. Those later events involve a lightning strike that emblazoned Wells' face on the window pane and, according to some sources, killed him too though other accounts claim the mob lynched him after all. Today, you can still drive to Carrollton, Alabama and see his visage in the glass despite many efforts over the years to wash it away. Wyndham often said good ghost stories do not require that you believe in ghosts, implying I think that storytelling is a kind of supernatural act itself. She claimed to have never seen a ghost with her own eyes. Jeffrey was only heard banging around the house and Wyndham described him as a presence. Catherine Tucker Wyndham died on June 12, 2011 at the age of 93. It's said by people who know Jeffrey remained in the house after she was placed in a special built pine casket and carried off to the strains of I'll Fly Away. Both his and her legacies live on, of course. A museum dedicated to Wyndham's work as a journalist, storyteller, and photographer opened in Thomasville, and she was posthumously inducted into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame. You can also, of course, get 13 Alabama Ghost and Jeffrey and her other titles uh, still today. Um, and thanks to the Selma folk artist Charlie the Tin Man Lucas, a friend and neighbor of Wyndham's, Jeffrey finally made his public debut when Lucas took a washing machine once owned by Wyndham and built a sculpture of the beloved ghost to be displayed downtown. I want to say the day I visited Wyndham's home, there was a noise of some kind in the other room and that Wyndham joked it was Jeffrey but maybe that's my own mind playing tricks on me now. I do know she gifted me with some jam, molasses, and candy, all of which I eventually ate. But the best thing I left with that day was a quote, which I included in the newspaper story I wrote about Wyndham being honored by Auburn University. I now keep those words taped above the desk where I work. We've got the best job in the world, she said, meaning us storytellers. Then she leaned across the table, smiled, and grabbed a hold of my arm. Enjoy it. Thank you. all Thank you, Caleb. That was wonderful. Um, and just as a reminder too, if anyone has questions for Caleb while they're fresh, you can go ahead and type them in the Q and A, and we'll answer them live when we get to the uh, the Q and A portion. And next, we'll go to Carolyn Curry, who's going to talk about Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed the presentations that we've had today, and great variety. And now we're gonna go back to the 19th century. And first I want to ask you, how many of you have seen this quote, well-behaved women seldom make history? I love that quote. You can find it on mugs, t-shirts, bumper stickers, and um, it's been very popular. And I don't know if you know that it was written by historian, Laurel Ulrich Aldrich. She's a Harvard professor and she was writing about Puritan women, no less. So whenever you look at American history, you can find outrageous women, unruly women and be surprised what you find among the Puritans even. And all historians would be so fortunate to have a line from a scholarly paper that would be picked up and trademarked and, and be seen all over the country. But it is certainly true of her quote, well-behaved women seldom make history. Now, why is that? Because it's so true. Women have had to act out, ask questions, be unruly to get into the history books, unfortunately, because so many women have been left out and so many writers have been left out. We've lost their voices. And that is what is so good about today. 
And I'm honored that I was able to write this book about Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. This is the first biography that has been written about her. Um, and I want to share her story because it is quite amazing. She was born in 1834 in Augusta, Georgia to one of the wealthiest families in the state. Her father owned 12,000 acres of land, six plantations, made his fortune on the back of slave labor. He owned 393 slaves. So when this young woman was born, she lived in a mansion in Augusta when she wasn't visiting one of those other plantations. She had a charmed life. She had servants. She called them servants. She didn't call them slaves. She said, we had servants that waited on her hand and foot. She had clothes. Uh, she had leisure. That was her most important thing, leisure, to do anything she wanted to do. She was a true Southern belle. She was a Southern lady. But that is going to change dramatically because she's going to start keeping a diary when she is only 14 years old. And she is going to keep it for 41 years. Very often when I'm speaking, I ask people to hold up their hand. How many of you have kept a diary for one year, really? But it was so popular in the 19th century for women especially to keep diaries. But hers is unique because she is so honest. And over that 44, 41 year period, you can see a transformation in her life. And you see it in the very beginning. In the first year she's talking, she talks about her clothes and what young man is coming to see her and somebody plays a guitar under her window. She's like a 14 year old girl, but she's obsessed with reading. She doesn't like sewing. She doesn't like embroidery. She doesn't want to talk about any of those things that girls are supposed to talk about. She asks questions. Why can't girls go to school? And she just, she wants to read everything she can get her hands on. And back then it wasn't easy. So every time her father would travel, she would say, bring me something to read, bring me something to read. So she read newspapers, she read history books. She made a list of 50 books she had read when she was 15 and she listed Shakespeare. She read Jane Eyre the first year that it came out. She read Charles Dickens, but she also read Uncle Tom's Cabin. She read everything and she began to have an active mind and she began to question. Now her father recognized this great intelligence and he sent her to Wesleyan. Wesleyan, it was Wesleyan Female College at that time, the first college for women in America in Macon, Georgia. She thrived there. She went at 15 and graduated at 17. I like to say, well, what was Wesleyan like? I describe it in the book. It was sort of like an advanced prep school but it was the best thing women had in Georgia at that time. And I say when she graduated in 1851, she was among the 100 women in our state that had, quote, a college education. Uh, that's what they called it, but she loved it. And she was asking more questions all the time. When she was 17, as I say, she graduated and then she got married the next year and she says, that is when my troubles began. She began to go through the peril of childbirth in the 19th century. And I say in my book that she probably leaves us the best record of what women went through in childbirth in the 19th century. She gave birth to 10 children and she saw four of them die. She had miscarriages. Uh, she had uh, she, she began to get angry. She was a good Methodist and she tried to reconcile her suffering with her religion, but she couldn't help but get angry. And this comes out in the diary because when one of her babies dies, she says, blessed be the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But oh, it is so hard. Nature turns shud shudderingly away from the thought that tonight my babe will light's first night in the grave. So you can see this conflict in her, her anger. And she sees women dying and she sees a double standard where men can get away with things that women can't get away with. And she starts asking questions. And during childbirth, she's going to bond with her slave women because when she can't nurse her children, she has to get a slave to nurse them. 
but she is very appreciative of it. And she begins to appreciate their hardship. And she brings the slave children into the house that are sick and has the doctor look at them. And she grieves when the slave babies die. So, she, and she's beginning to wonder is, is slavery moral? She talks to her slaves. She talks to Susan about her white father and the white father that sold Susan away when she was only three years old. I mean, there is such an honest questioning and looking at things around her. And what happens with Gertrude is she begins to take the side of the slave women. It's really astounding. And she talks about miscegenation openly and how cruel it is and how white slave owners could have children with their slaves and sell them. She was horrified. And she says it. I don't know how much she said publicly, but she was saying it in her diary and she was angry about it. And she doesn't think that this diary is ever going to be published. She thinks she's writing it for her daughters, but nonetheless, you can see this change that is happening in her with her suffering. She's no longer this charmed, uh, privileged young woman. And then the Civil War comes. Um, the Civil War was so horrific for everybody in our state and around the South, but she talks about the fear of having soldiers enter the home, uh, trampling the crops, what is going to happen. She's very honest about, um, is it, are we doing the right thing? And I'm, I was always amazed at the questions that she would raise in her, in her diary uh, during the Civil War. And she's beginning more and more to see the difficulty that women are having. So that after the Civil War, there is a great awakening in her, just as there is a great awakening in all women throughout the South. Um, her family goes bankrupt and she moves to Atlanta to live with one of her children, one of her adult children. And she begins keeping scrapbooks and she gives up, she says, I'm talking about, I'm tired of talking about my trials and tribulations. She don't want to write in that diary anymore. And she is entering the public domain, which in the 19th century, uh, women, women were supposed to stay in the domestic world. Men lived in the public domain, but she's entering it. She's writing newspaper articles and she is commenting on the condition of women. Now, women in the South, what vehicle did they have? Where could they go? There were no women's rights uh, groups in the 1870s. There were in the North, but not in the South. So it started amazingly enough in women's church groups. Women learned they could raise money. They learned they had organizational skills. They could help try to build an orphanage. They did a lot and uh, were asserting themselves, but it was still proper. It was proper for women because it was Christian and women were considered the moral custodians of the family. And so uh, there was an organization that came south in the 1870s that really changed life for women and really uh, had a huge impact, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And I always, when I'm speaking, I ask women to raise their hand if they've heard, everybody's heard of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, the women were talking about the evils of alcohol. Well. So many of them were suffering from it in their homes because there was a shortage of men after the Civil War. The men who came home were very often suffering from post-traumatic stress. They had drinking disorders. Gertrude's husband had a serious drinking problem. He had bought a substitute during the war, uh, as so many men did, and she was ashamed of that. They argued. They uh, disagreed. She uh, had disagreed with him about his treatment of slave women and she didn't think they should go out and work in the fields um, when they were pregnant. And she said, had I the direction of this plantation, they would be treated better. So you see this uh, anger that started back then and it's manifest during the Women's Christian Temperance Union because they're not really writing so much about the evils of alcohol itself, but the impact it had on women's lives 
that women couldn't feed their children, that men didn't bring home uh, money for the uh, woman to give to her uh, household and to take care of the children. And spouse abuse was so horrible. Uh, Gertrude wrote an article one time in the newspaper about spouse abuse, uh, which uh, was not illegal uh, at that time, but she says men who beat their wives should be shot was the headline. I don't know if she wrote it or somebody wrote it for, her, but you could see how angry she was and how strongly she felt about the well-being of women. But the Women's Christian Temperance Union had Christian in the name. Women could get on their hats and gloves and go talk about the evil of alcohol. So that was still okay with the churches. But when they started talking about the vote, it became radical, truly radical. Um, in 1895, the National Suffrage Association came to Atlanta to have a convention. They met in the Opera House. Gertrude went with other brave women that would go. And what happened? The churches came out against the meeting. Warren Candler said, suffrage for women is not only not scriptural, it is sinful. J.D. Hawthorne of the First Baptist Church said, any man that lets his wife participate in suffrage has to be simple-minded. Uh, the AJC said, we extend our Southern hospitality to our guests from around the state, but our women do not want or need the vote. So this was the sentiment so that a lot of women stayed in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they stepped back and did not go into the embryonic suffrage movement that was starting in Georgia in the 1890s. But Gertrude Thomas jumped in. And in 1899, she became president of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association, the first time they met in convention. And this woman that had been raised to be a very proper Southern lady, a wealthy Southern lady, a woman who was told that she should not speak in public, she was to be seen and not heard. In 1899, when she was elected president of the Georgia Suffrage Association, she stood up and she used a Christian metaphor in her speech in the House of Representatives before hundreds of people. She says, woman was not taken from the head of man. She is not his superior. Woman was taken not from his foot. He, she's not his inferior, but woman was taken from the side of man. And there she should stand his equal in the work of the world. Now this is 1899 and a Georgia woman is standing up saying women should be equal to men. It was really astounding very radical because the South was against the vote for women. Uh, they were, the South was conservative. Gertrude is going to have a stroke and she's going to die in 1907. So she doesn't live to see the vote. But even when the vote comes in 1920, Georgia is the first state to refuse to ratify. The state of Georgia did not ratify the amendment until 1970. But we weren't the last. Mississippi was 1984. <laughs> but it's a real struggle to get women recognized, women to get the vote. But Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas was a pioneer who was a forerunner for our freedoms and our privileges now. And had what I say about her is that we should emulate what she did. She was an avid reader. We should be reading, we should be informed. We, know, we should know how to tell the difference between truth and propaganda. We should take a stand and we should always vote. We should be unruly like Ella Gertrude and these other women that we have heard from today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and um, open this up to the Q and A. Um, I kind of guess I could start us off just by talking a little bit about how, um, although these are three different women from different periods, there really are so many similarities, and there certainly is the weight of that legacy. You know, as Carolyn was talking about, that 
still so many of these issues, you know, resonate certainly today. Um, I wonder if, as we're getting started, if each of you could just talk for a little bit, I mean, Caleb, you kind of already touched on this a little bit, how you became interested or how you found these subjects. Carolyn, can we start with you? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Um, I was in graduate school at Georgia State University, and I happened to go out to Agnes Scott, and I heard Ann Scott speak. She was head of the history department at Duke, and she mentioned Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas, a Georgia woman who kept a diary. But she said, nobody has written her story. Nobody has really researched her. And so that got me interested. And then when I had to pick a dissertation topic, John Matthews, my professor said, find somebody that you can think about for several years and not get bored. Well, little did I know that I was gonna think about her the rest of my life <laughs> because I wrote my doctoral dissertation on this woman. And then I have written the book that came out in 19, uh, I mean, in uh, 2015. And then this is an enhanced version that came out last year. So I have spent my life working with this woman. And I even have a portrait of her uh, that my husband and a friend found on eBay that's hanging in the foyer of my house. So she lives with us now. Uh, my husband stops and asks her a question every now and then. Gertrude, what do you think about that? So she's a real presence. And my children used to hear about her growing up. I mean, and she's had a huge impact on my life because of her courage and really how she questioned everything and how she read everything. And I think that is so important today. I mean, uh, don't be swayed by propaganda and untruth. Thank you. And I hope that portrait doesn't function like a Jeffrey. In any way. <laughs> Brenda, how about you? How did you come to find your subject? Uh, well, a close friend of mine named Fred Craddock, when he retired from Emory, he went up to North Georgia and founded the Craddock Center, which was to serve Appalachian families in all kinds of ways. And Helen Lewis was actually living in retirement up nearby, near Cherry Log, Georgia, LJ, at the time. And he met her and she became very active helping out with his work. And he, the more he learned about her, uh, the more she became a part of, the, of what they were doing and the more astonished he was at what she had accomplished. So I had gone up and done a performance of a piece that I wrote on Lillian Smith up there. And after that, he said, you know, you really ought to do something like that on Helen Lewis. I didn't know her at the time. And I had only just barely heard of her. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And he brought her down. Uh, she was living in Virginia at the time, later. And then uh, uh, he brought her down to visit and introduced us. And I, I don't know, I was just drawn in immediately and decided to do it. And uh, after she had left North Georgia, she went up to live in a retirement community in Abingdon, Virginia, which was founded by renegade nuns. Uh, she had been working with them, the Glen Mary sisters in Appalachia <clears throat> years before. And they had left the church because they wanted to do service. And they said all they were doing in the church was serving dinner to the priests. So they left and started serving the people in the mountains. And then when they all got too old to do that anymore, they retired together in a little commune in Abingdon, Virginia. And I spent several days there with the sisters, the Glen Mary sisters and with Helen. And she told me the story of her life. And uh, basically all I'm doing is just repeating some of the best parts. And I, would, I had to cut an awful lot, obviously, but I wanted to just tell sort of the basic story of her life today, but she tells some wickedly funny stories. She's got a great sense of humor and she is still alive. Uh, she's 96 years old, still living up there in Virginia. Wow. That actually dovetails nicely with one of the first questions we've got in the Q&A. Um, obviously, you've met her, but has she reacted to your presentation of her thoughts and words? And, and, and also the comment is, thank you for bringing her to us. Oh, uh, it's my joy to bring her. She has seen me do it two times. And uh, the very first time she saw it, she looked a little trepidatious, as we say, when she was sitting on the front row. But when I started getting laughs, she started warming up. And by the time it was over, she was very happy about it. 
I actually have a picture. I don't know if it's not a very good picture. We brought her up on the stage after the opening performance to sit down and answer questions from the audience. And she stole the show. <clears throat> it's, I, mean, I think everybody thought they should have just had her up there talking and not me beforehand. But I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is her right here, uh, already over 90, maybe about 92, sitting there just taking over. That's me in the middle disappearing. <laughs> so yes, she, I think she really loved seeing herself and hearing herself on stage. She said she did anyway. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so Caleb, our next question is for you. Perhaps many of us enjoyed the Jeffrey ghost stories when we were young and ghosts seem anchored to a certain place. What role does play play in Wyndham's work? What about in your works like Treeborn and in Southern Lit in general? Um, you know, all these stories in the in the 13 Alabama ghosts and the other state ghost tales too, they're, they are really anchored in place and they almost, the, a lot of times the ghost will almost serve as sort of these, um, they'll cause trouble maybe for the characters that, that are trying to, to make a life in a certain place or maybe they will almost serve as some sort of like a moral barometer for the characters in a way which can, can be quite interesting. You know, I mentioned how um, much architectural detail there was and sort of like how much of the historical record appears in the stories I, I kind of had I guess as a kid I sort of glossed over those parts and was just looking for the spooky stuff but looking back on it I could really see how much of a an, you know self-taught historian uh Miss Wyndham was and how interested she was in those things too you know she collected these stories and they were told to her but um one reason I've been interested in her work as as an adult and if you read my novel Treeborn, you'll, you'll see a little bit of this at play too, is that I'm, I'm interested in the intersection between oral storytelling and the written word and how, you know, I can in my work at least take certain elements of the oral tradition and, and squeeze them onto the page in fiction. And um, she does that really well. You know, at the time when I was a kid, I, I wasn't intellectualizing it that way, but, but now I certainly see that, that influence quite a bit. Um, and, and it's impressive, you know, the, the, to see her as a, as a folklorist and a historian on the page as well as just the phenomenal storyteller she was. Thank you for that. Okay, Carolyn, the next question is for you. Um, where did you find the material on Gertrude's life? Were you able to access all of her journals and the early family records or documents? Wow, I had a boatload of material to go through. The diary is at Duke, the original diary is at Duke. 15 volumes, 450,000 words, amazing. Uh, and then I visited her great granddaughter in Atlanta when I was doing my dissertation. And I found out that she had 13 scrapbooks. I referred to the scrapbooks and she was kind enough to trust me to take them home with and, and take them to my home. And I poured over them for several months because there was so much material there. And then I had an aunt in Augusta, Georgia, and I went down there and stayed with her. And I went to the minutes of the, I went to the courthouse and took those old gray, big old leather bound books off the shelf and went through deeds and um, court cases. I didn't have a chance to get into all the court cases she went through in her life. The family fighting over the property that was left after the Civil War. That's something we don't think about. Anybody that had any property, everybody's fighting over it. And her husband borrowed money from uh, his brothers and her brothers and sisters when he couldn't pay it back, they sued. It was unbelievable, the lawsuits and everything that I found in the legal records. So I had oral history. I mean, I talked with her descendants and, uh, but they were not as rich a source as these court cases, the scrapbooks and the diary. So I've spent years working on this woman's life. I know more about her than I do anybody. My, my family, my mother. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was really amazing, the material that was available. If you're gonna write a biography about somebody that lived 100 years ago, you've gotta be, you gotta be lucky. And I was very lucky because women are not supposed to write. You know, they're not supposed to speak. They're not supposed to be public but she left this private diary that she thought only her daughters would read. So I get a kick out of thinking about 
how many people are reading her words now? Well, I also wanted to point out that we've got quite a few compliments in the, uh, the Q&A or the chat, actually, I guess. Um, one person has also said, thanks so much for the Catherine Tucker Wyndham talk that she met her several times when they were working at the Alabama archives. Um, also that it's been a terrific panel. And Gina, of course, gives a shout out for Caleb Johnson's Treeborn, a beautiful and haunting Southern novel and check it out sometime. So to be sure on that one too. Um, I think we've got a, another comment on here from Pearl McHaney. She says, wonderful presentations. Natasha Trothaway said on Wednesday's keynote Q&A that the best thing for anyone wanting to write was to read and to get a good dictionary. These unruly women and the lost voices from the previous panels seem to have done just that, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think our last question is for Carolyn. Can you tell us about adapting Grow Strong for young adults? Oh, uh that's interesting that somebody has brought that up because I have started doing, I mean, I'm working on doing that. Uh, a lot of teachers have come up to me and said, we need more biographies for, you know, middle school children, um, especially more biographies of women, real women. And so um, I have started working on that and uh, Getting, I mean, I, I think there is a, a market out there, so to speak, or a desire for this. And so um, I think it could be uh, presented in a much simpler way. I think I presented it to my granddaughters when they were like in middle school. I mean, it was five years ago when it first came out. And I think it was too much research and too many footnotes for them. Uh, but I think that you could make simplify it by just telling her story, I think her story is strong enough and the example is good enough um, that there are lessons for young girls and boys, you know, to, to read, to ask questions, uh, look for integrity and honesty, and don't be afraid to speak up, be informed, take a stand. Uh, and the final obvious is vote. It's your responsibility as a citizen of a republic to vote. So maybe I will do that. <laughs> Thank you. And I would assume too that a modern, you know, young audience would also appreciate the journaling aspect, the diary, even though most people probably don't write diaries anymore. They're still chronicling their lives through Instagram or probably not Facebook. That's for old people, right? <laughs> I agree that we're going to live, you know, the internet, you know, it's going to, are we going to do everything in text and email? And I, I know that it's going to be out there, but the written word and the letters you read, they were so good. Um, and they expressed themselves so well. I, I uh, hope we don't lose that completely. Plus, it would just be a daunting task for any future biographer to sift through someone's social media account, for sure. Here, we have another question for Caleb. Um, can you talk a little bit about Wyndham's methods for collecting her stories? Sorry, searching for the mute button there. Um, you'd think after all these uh, year of Zoom, I would have this on lock. Um, yeah, you know, that's not something I'm super familiar with. It's not more, more of her journalism, you know, I'm, I'm a little more familiar with. Um, from, from what I know and can tell, having read the books and, and read interviews with her, a lot of it was just sort of word of mouth. You know, she knew a lot of people from her time as a journalist and a columnist, and she was a, a frequent and prolific letter writer, you know, and, and had a lot of letters coming into her at the newspaper. Um, and so I think a lot of it came, came that way. Um, if I'm being honest, and, and most of the stories are set, not all, but many of them in the Alabama collection, at least are set in and around the black belt. And that was her first book. So she was able to, you know, hear about these stories around town from friends and family. And then in a day, you know, she, she was raising kids, a single mother, drive out, you know, be on the ground, um, do some research and, and reporting work and then come back and, and write. So I think it was, I think one reason the Alabama book came early, um, knowing a little bit about her biography is, is for that reason, you know, for the, the ability to kind of go out in the field um, during the day and then be back home at night, having to, to raise three kids on her own. 
Okay, and I think we've got uh, one more comment. Um, these three presentations were just outstanding. What was so unique was the depth and degree that the presenters had for their materials, so bravo. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna scroll through and just make sure I haven't missed anything. Uh, okay, we've got one more question. Can Caleb and Brenda speak to their subjects journalism, such as what type of assignments and audience? I didn't hear the end of that question. I'm sorry. Sorry, maybe I blipped out for a second there. Um, I'll just repeat the whole thing. Can Caleb and Brenda speak to their subjects journalism, such as what types of assignments and intended audience? I uh, I don't totally understand their uh, to their subjects journalism. Um, was this maybe um, the speaker might have or the question person might have thought um, you know maybe about her writing kind of in general? Well. I, I really, I don't think I have a good answer for that question. Uh, my subject didn't do a lot of writing. She was an activist and she did a lot of teaching. She did do, she wrote some books about Appalachia, uh, but that came primarily out of her research and her teaching. Uh, so I, uh, I really, I, I don't think I'm giving an adequate answer to that question because I don't totally understand what, information she really wants or the questioner really wants. Okay. If, we'll, Caleb, let's we'll see. You. Maybe you'll do better than I. Yeah, well, like I said in my talk, uh, Catherine Tucker Wyndham started out, um, she was a daily newspaper reporter, so she was covering the police beat, the crime beat, you know, so that would have been developing sources at, at police departments, you know, um, looking at the arrest reports, you know, covering, going out to the scenes of crime. So she did that work early on, which is it's really amazing. I, you know, like I said, I was a daily reporter in Selma too, and I did not have the knack for working that beat really hard. And to think of her raising a family by herself and, and being a woman in Alabama, I had a conservative part of Alabama, you know, in the 1950s doing that work is, uh, it, it's so impressive to me. And, and I can't even fathom it to tell you the truth. But later on in her life, once she became a more renowned storyteller, she was a frequent contributor to Alabama public radio and sometimes national public radio. So you can actually Google her and I recommend everybody do this because her voice is so fantastic and she's such a great oral storyteller. Um, you can Google her, you know, her name, Alabama public radio and hear some audio of her telling um, some mostly humorous stories. Um, and it's, it's worth it for her voice alone because she just had one of the most beautiful, uh, great, I think, you know, uh, South Alabama accents that, that I've heard. So I, I recommend everybody do that. that. That sounds fantastic. And in fact, I'm probably going to look for some of those and then we'll be sharing them, I'm sure, on social media. So if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, keep an eye out for those because I definitely want to find those. <laughs> Okay, we've got another question for Carolyn. Um, can you, you mentioned that Gertrude was a, a literary reader, an avid reader. Um, what kind of literary influences did you find in her journals? Was she trying out any of those same kind of techniques? No, I just think uh, she was writing whatever occurred to her. I mean, I don't think she, uh, <clears throat> she wanted to write newspaper articles later in her life. She wanted to be a writer. She wanted to make a living uh, through writing and get money from it, but she never really did. Uh, <clears throat> you remember Mary Gay who wrote uh, books after the Civil War about the conditions. <clears throat> Some of the women just published their journals for um, Mary Boykin Chestnut, but she did not. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I think she was just writing from the heart. And then when she gets into her newspaper writing, uh, she's um, writing enthusiastically about the issue that they are addressing. Uh, like I say, the wife beating thing uh, that struck me. So that the headline was anybody that beats his wife should be shot. You know, like I say, I don't know if some uh, anybody else wrote that title, but she was very passionate about what she wrote. She felt strongly. And um, in some of her writing about the, for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, it was like a religious conversion when she went to South Carolina and saw 
Frances Willer, the founder of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, she came back saying, I now have something that I can devote my life to, something worthy of my life. <laughs> so uh, I really think that's what happened later in life. She felt like she was devoting her life to the betterment of women. And she threw herself into it. And she traveled a lot, uh, you know, to Arkansas, to Washington, D.C. in 1900 to represent the state of Georgia as president of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association as she'd ever been. Uh, so she found her voice and she was a speaker. And I got some quotes of some of her speeches. I wish I had more of that quote that I talked about. Man, uh, woman was not taken from the head of man. That came from a speech that she made at the Georgia legislature. But um, I don't really have any other writing that she did other than the diary and the articles she did in the newspaper. Okay, thank you. I think we have finished up all of the questions. So, um, and we actually are right on time. I don't know how that happened, but we must be magic. <laughs> thank you so much to all of our panelists today. I mean, this was truly wonderful. We're closing out the day with this presentation, uh, but we still have more tomorrow. And I'm gonna let Joe Davich talk about that for a minute. Thanks. Thank you, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Carrie. And once again, thank you, Brenda, Caleb and Carolyn for your fantastic presentations. Don't forget that we will be raffling off two copies of Suffer and Grow Strong, The Life of Ellen Gertrude Clanton Thomas, written, of course, by Carolyn. Um, and then we will be back again tomorrow at 1 p.m. for Reading Baldwin in the 21st Century that will be moderated by Laura McCarty of the Georgia Humanities Council and will be featuring Teravia Johnson, Jamil Zainaldeen, and Stephanie Dunn. Thank you so much for sharing this afternoon with us. We look forward to seeing you again. Don't forget that you can sign up for our last two sessions through Eventbrite and see a full copy of the program in the chat. Once again, thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon and the rest of your evening. Thank you.